What's going on, everybody? Jamie here. I'm coming at you out of Germany, my new home for the time being. And I'm very well. Luckily, right now, I'm healing as a person, improving as a person, and working on what I consider to be the most important work in the world. So all in all, like the short version is things are going as great as they could be, despite what's going on in the world. And of course, that's serious, the corona pandemic, it just kind of lets everyone open up their eyes at the same time, you know, and just do a lot of thinking while we're at home in lockdown. There's a reason why I'm making content right now, because I've got plenty of time. And a lot of people are making content too, because, you know, they're all cooped up. And what else can you do creativity-wise? You can have some good one-on-one conversations, which I certainly have, or just have a talk like this. And I'm, by the way, just, I'm going to tell you where to get the best podcasts on the interweb right now. It's called Dan Carlin Common Sense. He is a hero of mine and has been a huge influence on me as I got into podcasting because he, he does a political commentary, but these are kind of my own words describing what he does. It's it's the most empathic political commentary you'll ever get because he might be at one conclusion and understand that if most of the country or half of the country or a little bit less than half is not where he is, it doesn't matter how good an idea is if people aren't on board with it. You need the country on your side. So he's the complete opposite of um, being divisive because honestly, the people we share a country with in a democracy, we need them. Like we, we have to live together. So there's nothing really to be gained by being just unhelpful. You you just want to be constructive. And, and I just really like how he goes about his political commentary and he he stopped doing it for like three years because the situation post Trump's um, presidency just got so toxic. So he poked his head out for the first time in about three years and did a podcast and that made my day. And there's a lot of other great things to be grateful for. But Dan Carlin, everybody, I'm going to obviously link to that in the description. I'm going to write a note here for myself so I don't forget. And yeah. It's going to be a real treat if you like some mental, intellectual stimulation. And yeah, I've been getting intellectual stimulation myself because I had a bunch of Audible credits, you know, for the, you know, audio book thing with Amazon. Audi, no matter, okay, how do I put this? No matter how much this podcast may or may not blow up in the future, Audible is never going to advertise with me, ever. And here's why. Because I'm going to tell you right now how to get all of the audiobooks that Audible gives you for free without stealing. And it's called getting a library card. Unfortunately, I don't have access to my library card right now, so I can't really take advantage of these free online audiobooks from the library. But if you are anywhere near your library or already have a card, by all means, get in on it. There's an app you need to download called Libby, spelled L-I-B-B-Y. I guess I'll put a link to that too. And with that, you can get all the audiobooks in the world you want. So I had some Audible credits I had to spend. It's weird. You have to spend them before you cancel your recurring subscription with Audible. And yeah, it's canceled for good because I'm just going to go to Libby after this. But... You can get all these books, you know, any audiobook that's available, you can pretty much get. So I was checking out this one book called Hardwiring Happiness. I'm I'm not even done with it, but it's already given me some really useful tools. So I don't know, like I personally am kind of healing from a lot of personal stuff. And, you know, who who the hell doesn't want to be happier? Who the hell doesn't want to feel more empowered and like no matter who you are like as you are right now sitting where you are standing you are however good you are right you're good enough by the way 
you're good enough, you're worthy of a life, you're worthy of comfort, you're worthy of safety. Regardless of whether you're productive or not, of course it's cool to be productive, of course it's cool to live to the fullest of your potential, but even if you don't, you're still worthy. You are worthy. And it's easy for me to say that to people, to anyone. But some people, myself included, have difficulty saying that to themselves. So it's really weird. Like, no matter who you are, you have to be okay with yourself in order to just be happy because it's like you're stuck with yourself. So you better learn how to get along with yourself and be cool with yourself and at peace. So who the hell wouldn't want that? So yeah, I'm looking into intellectual ways to to increase one's happiness. So this book, Hardwiring Happiness, I'll just give away the gist of it. You can get more granular with it and it's a good audio book. And if you have Libby or Audible, I, I definitely would recommend it. Like, I mean, unless he turns on a dime and starts doing some like white supremacist stuff, like it's just hard for me to imagine what it would take to make this book not be awesome, considering the first half has been so great. And if you're wondering why white supremacy is on my mind, it's because I read another, or listened to an audiobook rather, this crushing book called One Person No Vote. Because, you know, I'm very involved in the anti-corruption fight, especially for American politics. So worldwide, I'm fighting corruption with my app, Glowpole, which is the people's platform. So it it measures the opinions of everyday citizens and elevates it to a place where these opinions matter in the political discourse. So that way, people who are commonly overlooked can have a seat at the decision-making table about policies that affect their lives. So that, that's a global phenomenon, which is extremely relevant for the USA. But then I'm also working with this anti-corruption group called Represent Us, which I love them. I love what they're doing. They're... We have this one, they, we, I'm part of Represent Us. We are working on passing this one big bill called the American Anti-Corruption Act. And in this bill, it has everything you need to make legalized bribery, aka corruption, which is completely legal today right now, or has um, loopholes you could drive a truck through. It would It would solve corruption in America. But right now, that has a snowball's chance in hell of passing in Congress because the people in Congress got into power through the corrupt status quo. So it's against their interest to increase competition because once you make elections more competitive, the sort of weak, corrupt people who made it into Congress through legal bribery and pandering to big donors, they're going to face a lot of competition from a new ethical generation of aspiring legislators and who with better policies no doubt because they're not you know bowing to the will of mega well wealthy mega donors so it's really not in the interest of the corrupt people in congress to abolish corruption so the anti-corruption act is the long-term vision for represent us and other anti-corruption crusaders and that's the long game But in the meanwhile, we're doing small city and state level um, policies one at a time, little campaigns here and there to help make elections more more fair. So, for example, the, the three big the three big problems are gerrymandering. That is when legislators choose which voters are going to be in their district instead of voters deciding who's going to be their legislator. It's a really crooked thing. And yeah, the short version is just, yeah, legislators picking their voters instead of the other way around. And if you read this book, oh, one person, no vote. I challenge you to read it and not get mad because it it just highlights how a lot of voter suppression that takes place today is a continuation of racism. So chronologically, you have slavery, you have Jim Crow, where, need I remind you, once once African Americans are legal to vote, 
they still face intimidation from not even always from like KKK people, but from town sheriffs just saying things like, I'll make sure that anyone, the first black person to vote is the last, it's the last time they ever vote. There are quotes in this book that are just disgusting. Just to think that a level of racism um, was tolerated within the last hundred years and is even going undercover and still, still affecting <clears throat> minorities now. So like voter ID, it on the surface, it doesn't sound that sinister. Like, oh, what's so wrong with, you know, making people show ID before they vote? But here's the thing. The IDs that are accepted are IDs that white people tend to have more statistically or that people who are in an economic hardship have difficulty um, have difficulty getting. Like you need to go to the DMV and these are in states where the DMV is closed most of the time. There's no public transit. And it's basically a way of excluding poor people. So like... People have put a lot of thought into making these laws seem race neutral, but the effect has been deemed to be surgical, done with surgical precision to erase the votes of minorities. Oh man, it gets me so mad. It gets me so mad and sometimes I'm too mad to even be productive, but then you've got to find that sweet spot where... Where the stuff that makes, or I'll speak for myself, the stuff that makes me mad, it just reaffirms that I'm working on the most important problem in the world, which is, as far as I see it, rogue governments. I'm talking about government going rogue, corruption, corrupt governments that aren't representing their people anymore. They they have the authority of representing the people, but truly they're representing corporations who would love to see the world burn to make an extra buck on paper to make a virtual buck to the detriment of all so it's the stakes are cataclysmic cataclysmic apocalyptic existential let me throw in some more college words so yeah if you listen to this the short version put in a word the short version is If you check out this book, One Person No Vote, I challenge you to not get mad. And if you're thinking, what's wrong with voter ID laws? And honestly, I I was at that point a few years ago. But then smart people who I trust, like I trust their analysis on it. They told me, they're like, Jamie, trust me. If you look into it, the way these voter ID laws are implemented, they have surgical precision targeting minorities. And if if you read what I read, I think you'll come away with the same conclusion. So that gets me riled up. And then I'm like, damn, I need, I need help to be happier. And then I listened to this book, um, hardwiring happiness. And so far I'm loving it. And, you know, Dan Carlin with common sense, he came out with a podcast recently where he's like the king of empathy when it comes to political commentary. Of course you want to you know, to make it fun, you want to demonize your opponent. Let's say you're a Democrat, you want to demonize the Republicans. They happen to be the ones benefiting from gerrymandering and voter suppression right now. Of course, those things could change, you know. Right now, Democrats are the ones losing out from the Electoral College, but that could change, you know. So I think if there's something you don't like, you should not like it because it's not fair, not because... You know, if it's politically expedient to say, I like this unfair thing, just know that the shoe could be on the other foot. But anyway, Dan Carlin, he's always talking about walking a mile in the other person's moccasins. And that to me, like in my own words, that just sounds like another word for empathy or another word for, I guess, walking a mile in the other person's shoes. I don't know why he always makes it moccasins, but the concept is the same. And it's just really cool because he understands that we in this country, we're in it together, not only for this pandemic, but we have to live together unless you want to have a civil war, of course. But barring that, we have 
to live together. You can't just get rid of all the people you don't like, nor would you want to. Can you imagine what that would look like? We have to live together. We have to find a way. So it's really like it feels good to just lash out at whoever the political opponent may be. But, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no gain from that. Long term, definitely not. Definitely not. So we have to live together. So Dan Carlin, he kind of takes the role of a peacemaker. And he, he just points out, and I, I've been keenly aware of this for a while, partially from listening to him and partially from being very closely involved with the media. Um, by that, I mean, like news reporting and studying it in school. And the short version is the business model of ad-supported news is fundamentally flawed because their job is to keep you hooked, to keep your attention and to aggravate you and get you angry. So the reason why that's a problem is because they're going to serve you up stuff about rapes, murders, fires and car crashes and things that produce outrage. The most outrageous person or the most outrageous story is going to get the most shares because it's outrageous and it makes you click And then when you click, you view their ads and the news outlet gets money. This is true for all ad-supported news and even ad-supported social media. Twitter and Facebook, they have the same incentives to share inflammatory stuff and to not really give a platform to the reasonable, nuanced, what I'm going to go on a limb and say is the, the silent majority. The majority of people I meet are not Nazis, are not, are not Maoists, are not, just they're not radical well i mean i'm radical but you know i don't meet people who concern me i've met i've never met a nazi but then a lot of people will say trump supporters are nazis and it's and and to quote dan carlin in his podcast episode um by lumping those people all in together if you say all trump supporters are nazis you make it harder to isolate the actual Nazis in that crowd. You give the real Nazis cover by saying all, you know, Trump supporters are Nazis. Obviously, some Nazis like Trump, but come on. How many how many Trump supporters do you really think are Nazis? I'm going to go with not that many. That's a line that I borrowed from him. Yeah, I actually took down notes. I took down notes while listening to the Dan Carlin podcast. I was biking across Berlin to help my friend relocates to his apartment, which is totally across town from me. I'm in the southwest of Berlin, in Steglitz. He's in the northeast. But anyway, I'm biking across town, listening to this podcast. It's like I'm jacked up on on feel good drugs, but the real drug is just Dan Carlin's voice of reason and peace and stuff. So I took notes. But I actually laughed out loud because he articulated what I was trying to say for a while. Yeah, sure, some Nazis might support Trump, but come on, we have to live together. So you're not doing our chances of a happy ending. You're not doing our odds any favors when you just say all Trump supporters are Nazis. Obviously, some are. And there are some evil people, you know, on every side. I'm not saying it's equal. Okay. I guess what I really want to say is the media is flawed in the sense that their business model isn't in line with the job they're intended to do. And I have a lot of sympathy for people in journalism because they're trying to do a good thing, but the because of the way business is done today and the way society does or doesn't value informing citizens, they're asked to work with an untenable business model. And I don't know if you ever had a job where like the boss gave you the wrong tools or suboptimal tools and you just don't have the right tools for the job and you're like, oh, I have to to rake these leaves, but you gave me a broom and it's really annoying. And that's kind of what the ad-supported business model is for someone who's trying to just inform citizens. You're trying to do a good thing and then you get punished by having to compete with clickbait and outrageous nonsense. You have to compete with them for attention, which is hard to do because 
uh, sorry that people care. Sorry that people care. And when they see like a car crash or, you know, a mass death or a burning rainforest, they, it gets their attention more than stuff that might actually affect your life more like, like tax policy or, you know, socialism for the rich or whatever, whatever. I guess what I'm trying to say here is the ad supported business model is, it's a failure. So I'm just going to give away what I think the solution is personally. I think the government does, we don't make police compete. You don't say to the police, you have to compete. Not only do you have to do your job, but you also have to be the best police officers uh, ever or else we'll just like drop you and replace you with like, we'll outsource, we'll outsource to a, you know, private policing company. That does happen in some gated community towns, but for the most part, police are, they're a public, they're a public expense. And not many people I know really raise an eyebrow to that. They're like, oh, it's a thing that society kind of needs. So society pays for it with the taxes. No one pays for the police at the point of sale, but of course we do with our taxes, but it makes sense. And to me, I think doing that for some high quality media is necessary. We can argue about how to implement that and how to make sure that this media outlet actually stays unbiased, but it would be hard to do worse than what we're dealing with now. The reputation of the traditionally respected news outlets is in shambles. The New York Times, they've really done themselves no favors. And the Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos. Those used to be the two most reputable newspapers. And they probably still are, but it's not because they're good. It's because everything else is worse. But if... If you want to live in a society with informed people, I agree. I do too. But in the defense of ignorant people, is there's not exactly one good place to read about the truth. That is a problem that's worth solving. Because people write into Dan Carlin and they're like, where can I get informed? Where can I get the truth? All I hear about is how how bad these mainstream news outlets are, where can I get the truth? And he doesn't have an answer for them. Do you see how that's a problem? Sure, it might cost some money. It might be, it might be $1 billion. It might be $10 billion. I think the BBC pays $100 billion a year for their news. But at the end of the day, it's worth it because the cost of ignorance is significantly higher than the cost of being informed. And... It's an end in itself. Producing worthwhile news media, I think, is an end in itself. Compare that to making Tomahawk missiles, which cost $1.4 million each. Bear in mind, the, the cruise missiles that our president sent into that airfield in Syria, that is about what it would cost to fix Flint, Michigan's water crisis which has been ongoing since 2014, people. This is what I mean when I say we live in a failed state, if you're living in the U.S., or, or as the economists would call it, a flawed democracy. How can we find $2 trillion to bail out businesses but not find $44 million to bail out a city with lead in their drinking water? Is there no political will to make sure that our fellow countrymen, women, and children are not drinking lead water? I'm not trying to be like a total sap here, but I wouldn't want my fellow countrymen to die in an unnecessary war. And I wouldn't want anyone to die. I don't want anyone to die at all, of course, but especially not if it's avoidable. I don't, I wouldn't want my worst enemy to have to drink lead water, let alone my fellow countrymen and women and children. Like, why is the political will not there? I, I'm a little bit outraged. I'm trying to be peaceful, but what the hell? 
It's frustrating. But the good news is if you ask people their opinions, you know, the people, the voters, the ones who theoretically have the power in this country. By the way, the problem I'm working to solve is to rectify the idea with the reality. The reality is we only have power on the day we vote. And even that is very diluted through voter suppression, through limiting our choices, watering down our choices. And of course, the fact that there's no penalty for politicians lying. And there's not much to keep them accountable. There are some things, there are some tools in the toolbox, but they require a lot of organization and mobilizing and stuff that is worthwhile, but it might not be profitable. Just like producing high quality news media might not be profitable and it might not be competitive with people who are, you know, circulating stuff about car crashes and murders. I don't think something has more or less value just based on whether it's marketable. Like some things with intrinsic value can't really be bought or sold as well. There's really good fruit out there that just has no commercial value. So the only way you're going to taste it is if you know a farmer or if you're lucky and you're just in the woods and you come across it. It doesn't make it any more or less valid than a watermelon or something mainstream. What I'm trying to say here is this is going to be sacrilege because I have a startup, but I don't see why everything has to be a competition. Like, imagine this. You have a goddaughter, right? She's 14. She loves to sing. She likes to sing, and it's great. And and then you tell her, like, okay, cool. I see you like to sing. Now you have to go make a living out of that. Or else you don't get to sing unless you do it professionally. And if you're professionally, then you have to learn how to sell your voice. It's really hard. It's really hard to sell your voice. You have to basically be a business genius and the next Rihanna just to just to make it work. It's a moonshot. It's a moonshot. So you're telling people, if you want to do this thing, you have to also be the best at it. The best in your niche. Like I I don't see the point in making everything a competition. You're talking to someone who until I was 20 like 21 or 22 didn't really do team sports. I was doing yoga, snowboarding. The only competition is with yourself. Compete against yourself yesterday. But who really cares what other people are doing? Is this anti-capitalist? Here's what I'm saying. There are things that are worth doing that if they do make money, cool. If they do dominate a market, cool. But maybe they're worth doing anyway. Maybe fixing the water in Flint, Michigan is worth doing anyway, regardless of whether it makes someone rich. Is that crazy? Or is that just being reasonable? Let me know in the comments. So yeah, I'm really pumped about Dan Carlin's thing. All right, now let's talk about me, what I've been doing personally for my wellness. Like... This is so, like, you're probably sick and tired of hearing all this. It's, it's the advice being parroted by a lot of people, and I'm checking it out for myself. Some is obvious, some isn't, but you've probably heard about the whole getting up at 5 a.m. thing. I've been doing that, like, half of the days. I'm, I'm still really yet to get dialed in. I've been doing all right at getting up early, but then it's really in the evening. It's hard to to shut it down in time to reasonably wake up at 5 a.m. the next day. And then there's also meditating, which that's kind of hit or miss. Sometimes I have an amazing time and I'm like, wow, dude, I should do this all the time. I'd say like 80% of the time, it leaves me feeling way better. And then some of the times I'm like, at least it wasn't harmful. There's no harm in taking 12 minutes to just breathe naturally. And I was using the Headspace app, which is good for getting started, would recommend, but I'm happy to say that I'm finally doing them on my own, unguided. I guess now is probably not the time to talk you through it in case you're driving or something, but it just, it feels good to get to the point where you can sort of do a meditation on your own. And it really feels like flying once you get to the point where 
you know, your thoughts are just passing and you sort of observe them. What I do in my mind is I kind of say, oh, would you look at that? Kind of in a detached way, like, hmm, indifferent to every thought. And it's like a stream. For me, it's a stream going from my looker's right to my left. I'm watching the stream and all the thoughts, they come and they go and I don't get hung up on them. And eventually there's just nothing and it's really tranquil and good. And I'm pumped about it. I'm pumped that I'm meditating almost every day. I'm pumped that I'm waking up early almost every day. I'm doing fitness every day, at least 80 push-ups, which for those who don't know, this is kind of a fun fact about me. From ages 12 to 23, I did 80 push-ups every single night of my life or every 24-hour period of my life. And then the years from then until now, I did have some slip-ups, some periods of time where I wasn't doing it, but I've been averaging easily at least half of the days. I'm doing 80 push-ups. But now I'm doing, I'm back on it every day now. And on top of that, I'm just doing like cardio around the house, like jumping jacks and a little bit of yoga and some pull-ups. And so I'm just doing a little bit of that stuff, doing some shadow boxing in the mirror, you know, because we all got to do prison workouts now. I don't know about you, but I want to come out of this lockdown looking great instead of the opposite, coming out chubby. I'm going to be doing prison workouts. And, and I have a balcony, dude, in my room here in Berlin. I was just sitting on it before I started talking to you now. But I've got a yoga mat too. So I'm going to be doing yoga on my balcony, letting my neighbors just see it, letting them see my form. They're just going to see my upper body. But yeah, yeah, I'm definitely committed to staying in shape through all this. And, you know, it sort of cascades down into a lot of aspects of your life, you know. And I, I've got it dialed into. I can't really do too much strength training in the morning. I can only do a little bit of cardio and stretching, but I can't go crazy because then I'll have monkey brain the whole day when I have to sit down. It's I'll be like hyperactive. So I can't go too crazy with the working out. And then I go for a walk and then I do these affirmations to myself, which is basically when you say nice things, you can say things that you can say things like I am enough. You can say things like I am where I need to be in the world. I am safe. I am I am good. Things like that. Or or you can go a little bit ham and say like I am always growing and learning. My actions are in alignment with my goals. My success is a foregone conclusion. I make my own luck. I just can't lose. Today is my day. I work hard every day. You know, you, you can say stuff like that. And these affirmations, they they are really powerful for positively programming your internal self-dialogue, which is so crazy because you want you on your own side. You need to be your number one cheerleader. And a lot of people, myself included, a lot of the time are not their own best fan, best cheerleader, and you need that. You need yourself on your side at all times. So if you have some like toxic, negative self-talk, which is just, um, it can just be really cutting, cutting you short of your potential. So these affirmations are really powerful, and I'm really happy to share those. Like everyone, everyone with a blog internet connection on medium.com is going to tell you to meditate. I'm just telling you what my experience has been like, and it's always worth the 12 minutes that it takes. But these affirmations, I think, like minute for minute of what you put in and what you get out, they're a lot easier to fit into life, I think. I just do them while I'm on a walk. And they're very powerful. So between a little bit of fitness in the morning and going for these walks, doing affirmations and meditating, I'm really happy with the kind of routine that I'm on. And then I work on glow pole things all day, which 
Sometimes it's building a brand. Sometimes it's building the product. Sometimes it's building the company. And sometimes it's prospecting of many kinds. Prospecting for users, prospecting for partners, prospecting for, well, B2B partnerships, investors, and also people who are going to invest in their time. And right now I'm working with a really cool guy who I met here in Berlin at an entrepreneurship meetup. His name is Michael. And he's going to do an update to Glowpole and do some urgently needed changes because there are some things in the product that are, you know, they're getting in the way of what Glowpole is meant to do. A lot of success as a person is just getting out of your own way. And there are features within Glowpole that also need to get out of the way of the user experience. So there's design work, there's, there's user experience work, there's coding to be done. There's, there's a lot to be done, but it feels good to be moving the ball forward. And some days we're running, some days we're crawling, but by, by golly, just, I'm, I'm telling myself now, but just keep moving in the right direction. And as long as Glowpole is moving forward, I'm happy because it's important. I know it is important to give the people of the world a platform where they actually have an influential voice, where we can actually affect the policies that affect our daily lives. Because without that, we can't have good things. It doesn't matter if 70% of the population is concerned about the environment, as long as the corporate donors who literally corrupt the people in Congress, the Democrats and the Republicans, as long as they are bought and sold, Good ideas won't win. People need more leverage in order to hold government accountable. And that's what Glowpole is built from the ground up to do. So if you'll indulge me, I'm actually going to read you a thing that I wrote about Glowpole in order to, to bring somebody from like a stranger off the street who never heard of me and never heard of Glowpole to someone who understands the gist of what it's meant to do. So if this is your first time hearing about Glowpole, let me know at the end of two minutes if you get what we're doing. This is posted on Medium, by the way, under my personal blog, Jamie Sleet. So Glowpole, the people's platform. What we do. At Glowpole, the people's platform, we help ordinary citizens have a voice on issues that affect their daily lives. Glowpole bridges the gap between voter desires and policy outcomes. Why we do it? This is so important because most citizens have no say on most issues that affect their lives the most. Meanwhile, elected officials lack the means and motivation to listen to their voters. Glowpole is here to help. Glowpole bridges this gap by measuring and leveraging public opinion data to enable good governance. How we do it? Measuring public opinion. Simply put, Glowpole allows everybody in the world to vote on everything. What that actually looks like is an app with forums and surveys that are built from the ground up with civic empowerment in mind. We measure public opinion in the most fair way possible through fair forums where all citizens have an equal voice and an anonymous vote on any issue that relates to them. Here they can also introduce new issues to be voted on by their peers. And we also have inclusive surveys. These check to see if the trends in the global forums are truly shared by the wider population. Respondents can earn rewards daily by responding to the civic survey. Global facilitates a real public discussion where the best ideas win. Unlike other social media platforms which favor elite voices, Global is an even playing field where your voice counts just as much as anybody else's. How do we leverage Global data? What Glowpole produces is real, relevant, peer-reviewed public opinion data. Most importantly, our data is localized, pertaining to every city, state, and country, and the world, and the world itself. For maximum transparency, we publish this data online for free to enable better leadership and empower citizens to hold leaders accountable. How we change the game. What this means is is for the first time ever, citizens around the world have the means and ease of access to make their voice count on every single issue that affects their lives. We provide leaders with the means and motivation through our data and accountability 
to represent their citizens. Glowpoll creates transparency where leaders know what their voters want and citizens know how and even if their leaders are responding. This is how Glowpoll, the people's platform, bridges the gap between voter desires and policy outcomes. Try it today and see why Glowpoll has been called the most empowering place on the web. Boom. There you have it. I wrote that, what was that, like over a week ago, March 23rd. But I had to get it out, people, because I, I've i been talking to other um, entrepreneurs. <laughs> entrepreneurs. I've been talking to other entrepreneurs, and they have such clean communication. And, you know, Glowpole, it is complex. There's a lot to it because it's a complex issue. You have to make a platform that's engaging and welcoming and inclusive and empowering for the citizens. And then you have to validate your data and send it to politicians. And if they don't care on their own because they just want to be great people, you've got to make them care. So there's a lot going on. And, you know, it might take you years to arrive at the same place as me of being like, wow, corruption is the biggest problem in the world or else we can't have a democracy anymore or we can't have good ideas win anymore. We can't have good policies. We can't have anything, anything anymore unless it benefits the super wealthy who are literally funding our political campaigns right now. Maybe that's worth changing. Maybe police are worth paying for out of pocket, even if it's a shared expense. Maybe publicly funding elections is worth doing. Even if it costs taxpayers a few bucks, it might win us back a lot more when we have legislators that are in touch with the people. But don't despair. I know I'm giving you a lot right now to be you know, upset about. But all you got to do is obviously sign up for Glowpole, check it out, earn your tokens. Every day when you do the civic survey, you earn tokens, which someday may be crypto secured. Basically, you'll retroactively get crypto for the surveys you responded to because once we introduce that feature, people will earn crypto in a very convenient format. To uh, So when you respond to a survey, you earn some crypto. Of course, you have to prove that you're real in order to get the crypto. But then when you prove you're real, you get paid in a sense. And then you also get to be empowered. So Glowpole will let your legislators know that real people care about these issues. But of course, we won't give away your identity unless you want to you know, send one-on-one messages to your legislators. But anyway, the short version is respond to the civic survey now, civic survey now, and earn those tokens, baby. But other things you can do in the even more near term that will start improving America like ASAP is check out Represent Us. They're the anti-corruption group I volunteer with and for and love all the people I've met there so far. And... Just stay involved with them because they're doing good things. And, you know, you can get involved in one political campaign or the other. Like, you know, there's a lot of excitement, was a lot of excitement with the Bernie Sanders campaign. But that's, it's like a moonshot because it's like you either get it or you don't. And then if the campaign fails or is undermined, however you want to look at it, you know, I'm not not here to, to blame blame, to lay blame. At least not right now, I'm not. It is kind of funny how the media just, like, put Joe, senile, sleepy Joe Biden. It's just funny how they put him in the protagonist position, and they just put Bernie in the antagonist position. And it's like, dude, Bernie's just been trying to help. He's just been trying to help people like you since before people like you were born, most likely. But anyway, you know, if you're supporting the Bernie campaign... It's kind of all or nothing. If he doesn't win, then it's like, it's easy to feel like all your effort was wasted. But what's so cool with Represent Us is they're racking up little wins here and little there, little wins there. And of course, we have the long game, which is to pass a nationwide anti-corruption act. But then in the meanwhile, we can help people in New York City have ranked choice voting. By the way, ranked choice voting is the simplest idea in the world that would fix so many problems. The whole lesser of two evils thing. Remember how Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were the only options? 
of the two parties. Remember how we only have two parties as quote-unquote viable options? With ranked choice voting, you could vote for the Green Party or the Libertarian, whoever. You could vote for your sec for these like offshoot parties. And that way, if if they don't win, if they don't get a significant amount of the vote, then your vote just automatically goes to your second choice and your third choice. So they'll, I don't know if I did a good job at explaining it, but with ranked choice voting, it becomes impossible to do this thing of wasting your vote. The whole concept of wasting your vote goes in the trash. So simple. Trump never would have got within 100 miles of the White House if we had ranked choice voting. And there's no way Hillary Clinton would have won either. It's just people get, they get bullied by their peers and by the media into accepting whoever the quote-unquote safe bet is and just towing the party line, voting blue no matter who, even if they're senile, even if Trump is going to mop the floor with them. Of course, it would be nice to be wrong, but then again, I'm just telling you, I'm not personally excited by a Joe Biden presidency. He literally said there will be no fundamental change. So he thinks everything is cool now. Everything is cool now. Things can stay how they are. As in not get better. As in Flint, Michigan can stay the same. They can have lead water for, what, eight more years. We can have dysfunctional health care for forever. Overpay for, just overpay ridiculously. Have our health care be tied to employers. How business worshiping do you have to be to what? So someone doesn't deserve health care unless they, they work for someone else. That's outrageous. So that's saying anyone who's an entrepreneur is going to have to buy ridiculously expensive health care. Like starting a business is hard enough. And do you really want to pay for health care from the, those exchanges? Healthcare.gov. You're either getting it free because you have no income or overpaying ridiculously because you have a little bit of income. It's outrageous. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds of healthcare, but a while back, I just, between friends, I said, a vote for Joe Biden is a vote for no change. Maybe I was inspired by a poll that I saw on Glow Poll about that, but, but man, I was hoping that was hyperbole. But he's literally labeling himself, himself as no change. Oh, I'm getting mad. Can't you hear? But I'm doing things to be happy. I'm doing fitness. I'm going for walks. I'm doing daily affirmations. And I'm meditating and calling friends. Video chat is pretty powerful. Doesn't it just make you think, I should do this all the time? Yeah, video chatting is so great. Don't be afraid of the phone. Hey, if you're hearing this and you have one of my numbers, call me up. Maybe just use WhatsApp or Facebook or any of the other mediums because my phone number keeps changing. I've got like 10 different SIMs. It's ridiculous. Uh, Still searching for my permanent phone provider here in Germany. Trying to make it permanent. So, all right, I've talked about pretty much everything I want to talk about. There's that book, One Person, No Vote. Read it and see if you don't get mad. If you don't get mad, you're very leveled, sir, miss, ma'am. And I'll put a link to that Glowpole blog in case you want to read it in more detail. Eventually, I'm going to add a bunch of links because a lot of the points that I touch on in this short blog open up wider conversations that I would be happy to have. So that's going to kind of shape the direction of the blog moving forward for the next few months. And of course, I did the plug for the Dan Carlin podcast. If you if you want some political commentary that just doesn't, that just, it leaves you feeling good and it leaves you, I think it fosters empathy, which is sorely needed in the world. I personally, it came to my attention that I needed to level up my empathy a while back and now I'm working on it and I I think making great strides. Uh, Level up your empathy. Listen to this podcast and see if you can walk a mile in the moccasins of people you might not like and just appreciate aspects of their point of view like challenge yourself and i promise it's worth it you're gonna feel good after 
Uh, yeah, I talked about that. Talked about voter suppression. Yeah, so on the reading list right now, first and foremost, if you have access to a library card, get one. Get Libby, right? And then from there, you can have all the audiobooks in the world. Well, anyone, regardless of your audiobook status, just check out Dan Carlin, Common Sense. He just released an episode called The Recipe for Caesar. He also does a really good history podcast called Hardcore History. And when I say really good, I mean the best podcast out there. So those are two podcasts. You're welcome. And then once you get the Libby app, then you can get into any book you want. I would recommend Hardwiring Happiness because it's done a lot for me already and I'm only halfway into it. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I promise I would give away the, the gist of it. So the gist of it is humans' minds, we have a negativity bias. We learn more from bad experiences and good experiences. So if something unpleasant happens, it's like Velcro in our minds. But then nice things are like our mind is like Teflon. So the good idea, the good things people say to us, good feedback, good experiences, they just kind of bounce back. And in order to sort of have those positive experiences be something that can just shape your mind for the better, you need to soak in the good experiences longer. So if something nice happens, in the most simple terms, just take like 15 seconds to just really bask in it and let it soak in. Visualize the nice experience soaking into you and just be like, oh, this is amazing. I feel great. And that's all. Now, he goes into more details. And if if that sounds like something interesting to you, read more. Get that Libby app. And then you can get Hardwiring Happiness for free. Or if you just love to blow money, do it on Audible. I don't care. I'm not going to post an affiliate link because that's not how I personally roll, okay? But get the Libby app, check out Hardwiring Happiness, level up your empathy, listen to Dan Carlin, Common Sense. If you want to get angry about racism that still manifests itself in voter suppression today, only do it if you have a strong stomach. But if you do have a strong, strong stomach, and want to get riled up and get on my level, check out one person, no vote. It will make you mad, but then you can just switch between that and hard hardwiring happiness like I have. And, you know, if you're trying to stay in shape like I am, um, sh- reach out to me and share some, like, fitness videos you're doing, right? There's so much on YouTube. Sometimes I like to just do jumping jacks and, like, freestyle it. But I just like having a video sometimes because it keeps me going and gives some structure. And I don't really have to mentally put together a fitness program. I I love it. And yes, if you are curious about what I'm doing and trying to... If you want to see the connection of how my work is working towards an anti-corrupt future, check out Glowpole. And you can really help me out with feedback. My friend... I got to do a quick plug for her startup because it's so awesome and I want to be the first customer. Well, hopefully not the first customer, but I want to be a customer. The reason why I don't want to rush it is because you can only become a customer when you die. Her company is called Relive and the concept, it's a sustainable death care solution. Basically, when you die, instead of it being a gravestone in a casket, and your loved ones paying tens of thousands of dollars to ha- like fill you up with chemicals and put you in a cask yuck. Instead, you become a tree. Your body gets made into a memorial tree, and then you're put in this beautiful forest, and your family can visit you as a tree. And I'm totally sold. I love the way Lucy, I love the way she presents it and how passionate she is about the problem. I'm passionate about that too because Hell yeah, I want to be made into a tree. I don't want to go into the ground in a casket and it just seems so much more sustainable. I want to re-enter the circle of life. So I'm totally sold on that. And I just had to do a quick plug for Relive. I'm going to include a link so that way you can you can sign a petition basically saying like I would be interested in this. And that's going to help her sort of, you know, it, it's just it's just entrepreneur stuff. You want to show the social proof that people are interested, and I myself am first in line for that. You know, unless unless someone dies earlier than me. 
but I'm I'm really pumped for her. And then just one more thing, I just need to re I need to do a quick plug for my friend Tejas's startup. I'm gonna include the link. Um, it's called Best of Me, and his thing is to stop clothing waste. Is a more effective way of helping people get clothes, and I'm really passionate about that too in a sort of less direct way of anti-corruption or environmental concerns, but it does tie back to the environment because the way the level of clothing waste right now is just outrageous. Most of the things people buy ends up in the back of the closet and they only end up wearing their favorite things. So he's trying to make it easier and less risky for people to get clothes that they're actually going to love. So that way, you know, you don't end up with a bunch of you know, closet filler, because that's a waste of money. And that's a waste of environmental resources. And, you know, 99% of the clothing out there is coming from sweatshops. So you really got to think about the ethical concerns. Like, sure, if, if you can afford to buy ethically, that's cool, but that excludes most stores. So, so like, if you're just understanding that the reality on the ground, unless you really go the extra mile, which if you do, that's commendable. But if you don't, I don't I don't really like always guilt trip the consumers. Um, you know, you're just kind of working with what you got. So if you're buying sweatshop clothes, which if it's coming from Bangladesh, it likely is. Um, just think like, how could I buy less clothes? How can I only buy stuff that I'm going to love and then not reduce waste? Reducing waste is always good. Waste. So, so I'm really passionate about what he's doing with Best of Me too. So... I'm going to put a link to that too. So, you know, if you want to get onto my level of, you know, the content I've been getting into and some of the practices I've been doing to boost my happiness, um, you know, I, I laid it all all out there for you. And if you're hearing my voice for a long time, for the first time in a long time, you know, I'm safe, you know, I'm thriving. I'm hoping the same for you and, and reach out, reach out in private and just Get in touch. Get in touch. Let's do a video chat. Let's have some tea over video. So, all right, it's getting kind of late. I'm going to wrap this thing up, but, you know, I'm just checking in on you, and maybe I'll do one of these things again in the future. Uh, Reach out to me and let me know what you think, and do me a solid and share the blog about Glowpoll. Share it with your friends. Give me your feedback also. And if you're on medium.com, Give me some claps. All right, that that's about it for this podcast. So, you know, smash that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next one. Take care, folks.